This is Dr. Kornman. We're going to talk about sacroiliac pathology and chiropractic treatment. This is a lecture mainly designed for physicians and therapists to understand chiropractic treatment of the sacroiliac joint disorders, but with repeated views and some research of some of these clinical terms, laymen can come to an understanding of this treatment protocol also. We're first going to discuss anatomy. The sacroiliac joint is a very unusual joint as it combines two different types of unions of bone. One is a diarthrodial joint and the other is a fibrous joint. The diarthrodial joint is the typical joint we all think of with two cartilaginous surfaces that move together. Finger joints, hip joints, elbow joints are thought of like that. The fibrous component is a thick band that really snugs the joint together and prevents motion. This joint has a total of one to three millimeters of motion. The joint itself is stabilized by the symphysis pubis. The picture that you can see on the right demonstrates that the sacroiliac joints, there's one on each side or two joints, are stabilized by the pelvis coming together in front by this heavy fibrocartilaginous joint. This creates a very stable ring with little motion. You can see here that the joint is heavily put together with ligaments that hold the pelvis into the sacroiliac joint. And you can see that this is the most heavily ligamented joint in the body. If you look here at the front view, you can see that the joint has very thin ligamentous structures. Most of the structures are in the back as the diarthrodial portion is in the front. These pictures on the right demonstrate how the joint changes with aging. The upper left-hand picture shows the S, which is the large growth plate, and if you can see the joint, which is the black line next to the S, that joint is relatively smooth. It is not interdigitated. As the joint matures, as you can see in the upper right, or B picture, the joint becomes serpentigenous. It becomes interlocked, so it doesn't have a lot of motion. Regular joints are smooth so they can move, but this joint is really designed to lock together. And then finally, if you look on the bottom, you'll see that the joint can wear out, the cartilage thins, and the joint becomes eroded. It's well known that pregnancy will loosen the SI joint, that longer lumbar fusions will increase the lever arm and stress of the joint, and that hip disorders also increase the SI joint stress. This picture demonstrates the biomechanics of the joint. The little C shape where you see the arrow in the upper part of the picture, that is the diarthrodial portion. And if you look at that little circle with the black and white areas, that is the center of rotation. So you'll see that that little C shape with the arrow is where the motion occurs around the center of rotation. And the rotation either goes, for the most part, up or down. So there's relative rotation around the synovial portion of the joint, and you can have an upslip or a downslip. An upslip is a posterior rotation of the joint, and a downslip is an anterior rotation of the joint. If one side goes up and the other side goes down, this is noted to be sacral torsion. The joint is thought in some people's mind to have muscular stability because it has large muscles crossing it. But if you look very carefully, you'll see there's very few muscles that cross this joint and the muscles that cross this joint also cross another joint. So they have to cross control two joints. In reality, the muscle vector forces to control, control an unstable sacroiliac joint is very poor, and it's very difficult to strengthen muscles to make the joint more stable. There's been plenty of studies to look for assessment of motion films, and all of these authors tried to look at three-dimensional motion analysis of these joints, and it was not useful 
for identifying painful SI joints in most patients. So now we talk about chiropractic clinical considerations, and yes, this is a chiropractor manipulating a horse. So a quick vignette of the history of chiropractic. Chiropractic was developed in 1895. A Canadian living in the U.S., Daniel David Palmer, or D.D. Palmer as he's known, was a magnetic healer, very interested in anatomy, and he was the one who performed the first spinal manipulation. As the story goes, Harvey Lillard was a janitor who worked in Palmer's building and was reportedly nearly totally deaf. He had lost his hearing years before when he reports he was bending over and felt a pop in his upper back. D.D. Palmer, who was knowledgeable in anatomy and interested in how the spine relates to disease, theorized that the pop and the loss of hearing were related. D.D. Palmer palpated and then manipulated uh, Mr. Lillard's neck, and Lillard note that he could hear the horses in the street after the manipulation. Palmer used this as a fulcrum and developed a series of chiropractic moves and two years later opened up the first chiropractic school. Chiropractic, as the term was known, was coined from the Greek words by Reverend Samuel Weed. Interestingly enough, D.D. Palmer's descriptions and philosophy of chiropractic was somewhat similar to Andrew Still's osteopathy established 10 years later, 800 miles down the Missouri River. Uh, There's an interesting story about B.J. Palmer, D.D.'s son, who continued to develop chiropractic. It turns out that Ronald Reagan's first job as an announcer happened to be with B.J. Palmer and the chiropractic school. So to understand manipulation, there are different types of manipulation. This diagram demonstrates active range of motion you can see in level one, where you can move your joint using muscles actively in a certain range. You know, there, is, there is passive range of motion, which is also called mobilization. This is where a therapist or a chiropractor can move the joint beyond the active range, but still within a physiologic uh, constraint. There is then manipulation, which brings the joint beyond its passive range of motion and essentially opens the joint up in a, an adjustment or a manipulation. What this adjustment is, is literally the release of the suction of the joint. All joints have a suction if they're diarthroidal joints. And as you break the suction, you create a rush of gas into the joint, which creates a cavitation or the, quote, pop, unquote, of the manipulation. We've done studies on this to find that the gas that goes into the joint is a combination of carbon dioxide and nitrogen, and you can't recreate the pop for 20 minutes, as that's how long it takes for the gas to come back out of solution and for the joint to develop a suction seal again. It's very similar to pulling a wet glass off a wet coffee table. Now, chiropractors can do this HVLA, high velocity, low amplitude, popper adjustment. There's mobilization. There's muscle energy techniques and other techniques which we'll talk about. Chiropractors use a different type of biomechanics because the manipulation requires lever arms and high and low velocities. So for the chiropractic biomechanics, if we look at the picture on the right, you'll see that the SI joint, which is in the far right side of the picture, is is the basis of the rotation. And if you look at the acetabulum, it's anterior to the center of rotation of the joint. So an upslip will rotate the ilium posteriorly and relatively shorten the ipsilateral leg. And a downslip will anteriorly rotate the ilium and lengthen that leg. And leg length discrepancy is a chiropractic 
diagnostic tool. There are different techniques to work on the sacroiliac joint syndrome. There is diversified adjustments, the typical, so to speak, high velocity, low amplitude, quote unquote, adjustment or pop. You can use a drop table. There are flexion distraction tables. There's the sacro-occipital technique, active release technique, the activator technique, and mobilization, and we'll discuss each of these. Motion palpation is the general technique chiropractors use to determine if his joint is fixated, hypermobile, or as some chiropractors will say, in or out. There really isn't necessarily an in or an out. It really has to do with fixation. So you can palpate the SI joint, small posterior to anterior motions on the PSIS and the ASIS will determine whether the joint is fixated anteriorly, posteriorly, or hypermobile. And rotational maneuvers can determine the direction of the manipulation or the pain relief. Leg length checks are the bread and butter of many chiropractors. It's a subtle test of pelvic obliquity, where if the the ilium is rotated anteriorly, that of course will drive the leg a little longer, and if the pelvis is rotated posteriorly, will drop or shorten the leg. So you use gentle pressure on each heel, and you look for a give or a resistance to compression. Leg traction maneuvers can help to determine if the pelvis is rotated anteriorly or posteriorly on that side. So since the acetabulum is anterior to the center of rotation of the sacroiliac joint, traction on that leg rotates the joint anteriorly. So relief of ipsilateral SI joint pain will indicate a posterior fixation on that side, and increased pain indicates either an anterior fixation or instability. So there are chiropractic corrections with manipulation, which is the high velocity, low amplitude manipulation. You place a toggle force to the PSIS if you want to drive the iliac wing anteriorly for a posterior locked iliac wing, and the toggle force on the ischial tuberosity to drive that wing posteriorly. So for a sacral upslip or a posterior fixation, you'll have a functional short leg on that side. You'll have palpation resistance of the PSIS to anterior translation. You'll have, to correct this, the manipulation contact will be on the PSIS to drive the ilium anteriorly. This is what the manipulation looks like. This chiropractor is using his elbow to drive the force through the PSIS. You can use your hand or your elbow, either one. So you'll see that the patient is rolled so the spine is rotated to take all the slack out of the spine. And that rotation is shoulder one direction and pelvis the other. As I said before, the contact point on this particular one is the PSIS, and the force is driven in the direction opposite the fixation. For a posterior fixation or a sacral upslip, what you want to do is drive on the PSIS in the lumbar roll position to open the joint through the shoulder and the knee and the driving force is antero superior. So this is the contact force for the downslip where the PSIS has no give, leg traction yields no relief, axial leg compression may give partial relief, and positioning in this adjustment position quote, feels good, unquote. You can see the driving force on the PSIS here, and he's going to rotate the pelvis posteriorly. You can do other techniques that don't require this rotation, such as drop tables. Portions of these specific tables will drop approximately two centimeters when moderate downward pressure will release the friction lock mechanism. This allows the velocity of the manipulation to increase and then come to abrupt stop, increasing the force on the manipulated area. The lineup is a little different than your obvious manipulation. You directly contact in the PSIS, and the force is driven anterior superiorly, and of course this is for a posterior rotated ilium. 
There is another type of technique that chiropractors have invented called the sacro-occipital technique. This relies on gravity and gentle manipulation to balance the pelvis. This is more effective for a pelvic torsion, but can also be used individually for a posterior anteriorly rotated pelvis. Getting the adjustment to hold may require taping or an SI belt. And you can see here in the lower picture, the sacral pad is placed under the ASIS to drive it posteriorly. These can also be used in the AP fashion, where you can rotate the pelvis based upon the placement of the blocks. Five to 10 minutes of position with gentle mobilization will be helpful. The activator is a tool invented some years ago and is used by many chiropractors. It doesn't involve mobilization or manipulation. It's a quick response to a device that has an, a mechanical trigger and there's a specific area of muscles and or trigger points that you can use to try and relieve pain. I'm not sure of the technique uh, theory, but there are patients who get good relief from this. Finally, there's mobilization. Mobilization, of course, is designed to stretch and reintegrate the ligaments and muscles around the sacroiliac joint. And mobilization can be magnified by this table called a flexion distraction table. This is where the upper torso is stabilized on a chest platform and the ankles are bound to the distal portion of the table. This table articulates at the lower lumbar spine. It laterally bends, distracts, rotates, and flex extends. And you can generate significant force on the lower lumbar spine and the pelvis at the articulation and this will give you mobilization greater than if you tried to do it just using the legs as lever arms. Finally, there's an SI belt. The SI belt orthosis is designed to be used for patients that don't, quote, hold, unquote, their chiropractic manipulation or patients with instability. Thank you, and hopefully this gave you some ideas about the sacroiliac joint itself.